Well, thank you so much for the very kind introduction and, uh, and also for your hospitality. This is uh, it's a wonderful place to visit. And, and the weather, of course, is gorgeous today. So it has, <laughs> Hawaii has nothing on this. <laughs> now, there's some times of the year run. I suppose that isn't true, but uh, certainly uh, this is Chamber of Commerce weather. You could attract uh, businesses, students, all sorts of people <laughs> on a day like today. Um, so what I'm hoping would, will be helpful is to talk about two issues. Uh, the first is um, what evolution is, what evolutionary biology is. What is it that we teach? <laughs> what is this all about. And there's a lot of misimpressions about what constitutes evolution of biology. And then with that, uh, investigate whether the ideas in evolutionary biology are in any sense inherently hostile or strange to someone um, from a Christian faith uh, perspective. Is there anything weird or satanic in it? And uh, so that's the first part. So we'll just go through some of the elements, or, or the principal elements of evolutionary biology and see, see surprisingly enough that these ideas, the ideas in evolutionary biology are actually found in the Bible. Now they're not put together into a theory of evolution, but the, the ideas themselves, the individual ideas are, there, are already there. So there is, as you will, see nothing inherently hostile about evolution to Christian ears. And then the second part of the talk will be uh, a review of the, at least some of the main players in the current science evolution uh, debate, if you could call it a debate. Um, because as you will also see, there's a lot of people want to hear both sides, so to speak, as though there were two sides. And it will immediately be obvious that there aren't just two sides, and there are lots of, lots of angles. And so I've tried to make a classification of what some of the major angles are, so that you can position yourself in, uh, in the context of current uh, discussions. So that's what I'm hoping would be helpful. Uh, and so I'll be talking specifically about biological evolution and not the origin of life, not the origin of the universe, but specifically the birds and the bees, the uh, evolutionary biology. Now there are, for us evolutionists, there, there are two main facts. Facts. Uh, there's a fact, there's some facts, and then there's a theory. So I just wanted to make a take a strong fact theory distinction. So there's certain facts about biology, and then there's the theory of evolution built on those facts, if you will. And one fact is that all of life is united through membership in a common family tree. And here's a picture of one of these trees. Um, and as you can see right here, I hope, <laughs> these are various bacteria. And, uh, and algae, and the eukaryotes are the animals and plants that um, have a nucleus within their cells. So the bacteria don't have a nucleus within the cell. They're just by themselves, and the DNA is just sticking in there. But in the eukaryotes, there's, there's a nucleus. Now, when you think about it, this is really a gargantuan tree um, because you can continue the tree. Take, just take one of the branches. And this takes you out to the animals and the mammals in particular. So these are sponges, cnidarians. These are all different kinds of uh, animals here. Flatworms, mollusks, rotifers, insects. So all these animals are related to one another. And, and how do you know that? Well, you know that just the way you would detect paternity, do a paternity analysis. Uh, so you take, as, as you know, if you've ever tried to chase down a deadbeat dad, <laughs> for example, <laughs> and uh, 
and you wanted to establish paternity, and then what you do is go through this little rigmarole where you uh, extract some some DNA from a little tissue sample from from a baby, and then you, you can look at some DNA from a from the potential father and see that they're the same. And by golly, um, that's how you establish paternity. So what's been done here is you could think of really as a kind of paternity analysis that's been carried out among all these uh, different creatures. And here when you get down to the mammals, which is one, you go to the vertebrates and then you go to the mammals, then the mammals also expand into all the different kinds of mammals. So this is, this is a fact that all of life belongs to a common family tree. And I've sometimes fantasized that it would be really nice if, if some entrepreneur would make the counterpart of a, a, uh, a chemistry set. You know that you've probably given your kids a chemistry set sometime to play with. Well, imagine getting a little chemistry set where it has like a funnel in it. And you take a butterfly, and you take a worm, and you take a little piece of your own skin, like from... Taking, putting your finger in your mouth and taking a little bit of the tissue from the inside of your mouth. You put this in the funnel, and the little machine goes chug, 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 and it spits out a little ticker tape which says how closely related you are to a bee or to a worm or to a bumblebee. And there's nothing really obscure about these paternity analyses, and they're getting cheaper all the time. So... This is not, you know, at once only experts knew that the earth was round. Now everybody knows that the earth is round. And someday everyone will know that we all re are all related to all other living things. And all living things are related to one another. Now that's a fact, and it's not a necessary fact. Uh, when Darwin was originally visiting the Galapagos Islands, um, he could see that the birds he, that he was looking at were descended from, were closely related to the birds he saw off the coast of Tierra del Fuego uh, in the bottom of South America where he stopped off. You see the same birds. And just the way you know that different dogs are related and dogs are close to wolves, and you can just tell that they're clearly family resemblance. He could see this family resemblance to the birds in South America. So when he said that all of these animals are related to one another and are descended from one another, all he had at that time was a sample of the birds. So it could, could conceivably have worked out that um, as you go around nature, you would find different clusters of things related to one another, like all, all the mammals, and then something else, or some other part of the world, all the marsupials. Uh, and they may not all tie in to one another. But the finding from this sort of gargantuan paternity analysis study is that everyone belongs to one tree, so that all the life on the earth is not, say, five trees, or five separate trees, or two separate trees, that uh, the same DNA is shared, same kinds of genes, same kinds of ways of doing biochemistry, same kinds of ways of doing metabolism, are, are found in everything. And so this is just a simple fact that all of life is related. So that's where biologists start from that fact. Now, is that fact, let's just consider that as a fact, is there anything hostile about that fact. And so I've quoted here from a couple passages um, from the Bible and using the King James translation, which all deal with the notion of we are members of a common body, the community is one body. And uh, this is St. Paul's uh, writings. We are many we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. This is, of course, the significance of Holy Communion, is to reaffirm this. And then there's this very interesting passage, which I'm sure many of you have heard, uh, because it's part of a lectionary, 
Um, for the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body. Is, is it not part of the body, if the foot says that? But now hath God sent the me- set the members, every one of them, in the body. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of these. And those members of the body, which we think to be less honorable, among those, we bestow more abundant honor. And I can, you know what piece parts of the body you're thinking of. That there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now ye are the body of Christ. So this is the notion of us all, of a Christian community, being one body. It's a corporal um, metaphor. And this idea is simply be, the observation that we are all one family tree simply extends this metaphor to all of life. And it's not restricted to the Christian, to a Christian community. And it's also interesting because uh, when you think of biodiversity and of all the species out there, According to this passage, and also the passages about the, the ark, where the animals, various animals are put in the ark, back in, in the Old Testament, where God doesn't pick and choose just some species to go in the ark. They all go in the ark, including those that were, quote, clean, and as well as those that were unclean. They all get in there. They all get saved, and then they all get back off the ark. And... This also has the same point, that all parts of the body are valuable. It's not as though we can go out in nature and say, okay, well, that species we can get rid of. We don't need that one. Then apart from functional issues, you know, not just that it's important because it provides food or it's a keystone in the web of life, but that it's inherently valuable. Every species is inherently valuable because it's all part of the same body. And that's, this, is, this is the message that you're getting from science, but you're getting it, of course, in scientific jargon. But it's the same message that you clearly see in the Bible. Now, the other fact of biology is that all species change through time and place. Okay, why is that interesting? Because at the time that Darwin was actually working and making his discoveries, riding around on the beagle getting seasick, he was, the idea in the wind then was that biological species were the biological counterpart of physical species. And as you know, the periodic table of elements is a nice table that has a list of all the different elements, from hydrogen, helium, oxygen, all these things. And uh, the hope was, or the supposition was, that we would assemble a big catalog that would be the counterpart for biology of the periodic table of elements for physics and chemistry. It would be this great big table of all the biological species. Now, a property of the elements is that they don't change. Like water, or, or take, an, take an element, uh, uh, oxygen, say, nitrogen, it's the same everywhere. You don't go and have a South American variety of oxygen or an African variety of oxygen. And if you even take the compounds, the, phys- the uh, chemical compounds like water, a combination of hydrogen and oxygen, it's the same everywhere. And it's always the same. It always is the same freezing point, and always is the same boiling point, and same color, same weight. All these physical properties are the same. But the point is, and this is where Darwin, in many respects, I think his most fundamental insight, is that that, that isn't true for biological species. They're just plain, first of all, not the same everywhere. And this turns out to be a very easy point to confirm. Now, I've personally done a lot of work on lizards in the Caribbean. You see, I'm drawn to islands. I love islands. (laughs) And uh, 
and I, my dream was to live on one, and finally got old enough that I was allowed to. <laughs> so I don't, I don't have to eat broccoli, and I can live on. <laughs> I can live on an island. <laughs> so, at any rate, I work on this is Hispaniola, a map of Hispaniola, and uh, you know the Dominican Republic's on one side, Haiti's on the other, and I used to work on these lizards that live on trees. And um, now, as you go around, you can just rent a car, rent a Hertz car, and you can drive around the island. And as you go around, you see that they vary in the color of this structure called the dewlap, which is a skin flap underneath the chin. And anola lizards don't have a voice. Geckos do have a voice. They talk to one another, and they're kind of noisy at night. But um, anoles are, are active during the day, and so they communicate visually, and they have this skin flap that they uh, send out and pull back, and they send like semaphore signals to one another. So the the flag, the semaphore code, if you will, varies from place to place. And this varies continuously from this to this. So you could get, get a car, and as an exercise, and I, I remember doing this as a student, you drive 10 miles, you get out and look at the lizard, and say, okay, well, that's what the dewlap looks like there. Get in another 10 miles, you get out, the dewlap's a little different. And you just keep doing this. You can do this all around the island. That's called geographical variation by biologists, and it's for any widespread species, that's what's there. You can find it. And this is a, a case, this was a species I worked on to some extent, a fairly large extent, in Dominica, in the West Indies. And Dominica is about five miles by 15 miles, more or less rectangular with a mountain in the middle and a lot of rainforest. And this is what the lizards look like in the rainforest in the middle of the island. This is what they look like in the northwest corner, the southwest corner, um, northeast corner, northwest corner. And, uh, and again, they're, they continuously vary from like this. It's not as though this is an isolated form. You can't name it a species because if you go 10 more miles away, it's halfway between this and this. And this is also true and you don't have to go to an island to see this kind of effect. You can do that right here. You can rent a car and ride on a, around a Route 80. And you can go from, from New Jersey to California to San Francisco along Route 80. Or you could, if you want to follow the ancient TV program, Route 66, so you can go along Route 66. And you can get out and you can look at the robins. And I don't know if you've noticed that the robins in some places are, are thick and squat with a great big red breast, and other places they're kind of small and they don't have much of a, much color to them. And that's geographical variation. So you see all this variation everywhere, and everything has it. These are African birds, that, uh, and you see the colors vary here. See, look at this, the plumage varies from place to place. And since I always think of vertebrates, but let's throw a sock to the insect folks here. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and uh, these are bumblebees. See bumblebee geographic variation everywhere. So this is, this is a basic fact. You know, it's not really contested. So that shows they vary in space. Now, do they also vary in time? That's a little harder to see um, because you can only see a snapshot you know, of what they are at any one time. But on the other hand, it turns out that there are collections of animals uh, by hobbyists that are stored in museums and in private collections, especially in England where we're having butterflies and moths and, and bird specimens. Uh, and collecting them, and store, either storing them in private collections and storing, storing them in museums. And you can see, uh, if you look at a record of these, that they change, and they change when the habitat changes. And if the ha for cryptically colored animals, if the habitat gets uh, uh, darker from pollution, then slowly but surely the animals start tracking it and they get darker. And then if you clean up the pollution, then by golly, they start getting lighter. 
And there's really no dispute that there is variation in space and time for, for species. And this is fundamentally different for biological species compared to physical species. Now, biologists take this fact, these two facts, and construct a theory. And the theory is really simple. So first of all, where does the variation come from in the first place? It comes from so-called mutation. Now, mutation does not mean a hopeful monster or something like that. All mutation means is that there is a copying, a, a difference between the copy and the original, which is called an error, but it's not really an error necessarily. Uh, and you all know from using a Xerox machine that the copy that you get may not be exactly the same as the original. You have little specs in it and stuff like that. Now, here's the thing. So if you make a lot of copies of the original, you're going to get a lot of variation. But the neat thing is that just occasionally, one of the copies is going to look better than the original. Because if you're, say you're copying a photograph, the photograph has a boring blue sky. Occasionally, you might run out of ink somewhere, and you might get a cloud <laughs> turning up in one of the copies. You say, well, that's much better. That's called a favorable mutation. Whereas one of the copying differences, which is not so attractive, would be an unfavorable mutation. So that's what mutations are. Now, the unfavorable mutations, which turn up, like uh, the ones indicated in white here, they're selected against, so that you, so to speak, could throw that piece of paper away, because you don't like what it looked like. Or, similarly, that mutation might produce uh, a color in the animal, which made it very conspicuous to predators, and it got eaten by predators. Whereas other mutations might be beneficial. And so some of the variants um, will survive, so hence you have two, two. And some of them, one of them, for example, might be, might not only survive from the pruning stage, but might be so good that you make extra copies of it and give it to your friends. Okay. And so that's reproduction. And uh, <laughs> if only it were that easy. <laughs> so that's the theory of evolution, period. That's sort of all you need to know. And that's basically all we teach, that uh, there is variation, and the variation, some of it's favorable, some of it isn't favorable. And the species comes to resemble the favorable mutations. So that all the copies of that picture are going to have that cloud in it after a while, because they're the only ones you give to friends. There it is. So is there anything you know, difficult or threatening about that? It's very uh, innocent. More importantly, um, the, those very ideas, the ideas of a random mutation, that is just a, a difference between the original and the copy, as well as selection or pruning, they're also found in the Bible. There's not, these are not foreign concepts to humanity that scientists dreamed up. Now, the notion of randomness is really important to find an antecedent in the Bible because a lot of the critiques of evolution uh, lay at its feet the proposition that evolution is random. Yeah. Well, no. Mutation is random. Evolution isn't random. And here's the notion of randomness. And it's also from a passage you may recognize. It's in the lectionary. Behold, the sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up, but because there was no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. 
and some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But others fell onto good ground and brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Who has ears to hear? Let him hear. So this is, these seeds are tossed at random, and some of them hit soil, which lets them grow and reproduce. So that's, that's randomness. And it's a very interesting context right here, because Jesus is talking in this passage about uh, his message, the, the message of he who has, hear, has ears to hear, let them hear. And Jesus doesn't, you know, telegraph his message only to those who can hear. He speaks to the multitude. Now, presumably, he could know who was going to hear and who wasn't going to hear, but he doesn't. He just sends it out there and then lets, so to speak, the free will of the individuals who do hear act on it. And that's where you get this notion of randomness. Uh, a mutation in biology you could think of as a mustard seed of DNA that's tossed into different bodies. And as it's tossed into different bodies, in some bodies it flourishes and becomes a gene which is then passed on in great quantity down into the future. It's the same idea. Now, how about the pruning part? Now, the Bible has lots of passages about farmers and farmers breeding. And this is a really interesting one right here in the uh, Old Testament. Jacob, Jacob, uh, as recompense for previous injustices, makes a deal with his master, Laban, to keep for himself the cattle that are speckled. So in this, God is taking uh, Jacob's side because Laban is um, the bad guy in this. And the passage goes, And it came to pass, whensoever the stronger cattle did conceive, the feebler were Laban's, and the stronger were Jacob's. And the angel of God said unto Jacob and said, Lift up thine eyes and see all the rams which leap upon the cattle. I love that. The rams which leap upon the cattle are speckled, for I have seen all that Laban doeth unto thee. So that we have, God, as I said right here, God's hand molded the evolution of the livestock in Jacob's favor by determining which rams bred namely the ones who leapt upon their mates. So, in the Bible, you have breeding. And you have divinely, in this case, divinely directed breeding. And the stock comes to resemble the, the form that does most of the, uh, most of the mating. So, so there it is. So this one doesn't have anything about the source of, this particular passage doesn't mention why some some cattle are speckled and others aren't. It takes that for given, as a given, and talks about the uh, selection that follows after that. But it's the randomness passage about, about the seeds, which talks about why the mustard seeds talks about where you get the, ran, the variation to begin with. And similarly, you get uh, other discussions of pruning. This again, this is a uh, this is Jesus. I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth, that it may bring forth more fruit. I am the vine, he are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye are nothing. And if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. So again, the same metaphor of pruning and of breeding. So that's my basic point, that what we actually teach as evolutionary biology does have antecedents in the Bible. It is a very simple idea, and there is nothing inherently hostile about it to a Christian community, and there is absolutely no reason on the basis of Scripture not to teach it and to regard it as somehow um, um, antithetical to, to faith and belief. 
So I'd now like to turn, if I might, to the question of the debates about the appropriateness of this uh, in our curricula. Now here's the issue. In 2004, uh, the CBS poll showed that 65% of all Americans favored teaching creationism, creationism along with evolution based on a nationwide survey of 800 adults. So in 2005, the Pew Forum finds the same thing. So both polls show that 40% of the population, that's not a small number, this is a huge chunk, favor replacing, replacing evolution with creationism in the science curriculum. So in 2004, the Finkelstein poll reported that 65% of the people now, the 65% of physicians approve of teaching both evolution and creation in the schools. These are fairly recent polls. Now, that's interesting because, that's a, as I say, people who are drawn to creationism are not wackos. This is uh, all kinds of professional people uh, people from all, all walks of life uh, have this view, including people like physicians who are trained as biologists as pre-meds. Of course, what this does show is that the pre-medical education doesn't include any instruction in evolution or in diversity. All it includes is biochemistry and, and medical topics. So there are no, some physicians are no different than the general public uh, in, the, in regard to its, their views of evolution. And then it says, and 11% of Catholic doctors and 35% of Protestant doctors believe, quote, that God created humans exactly as they are now. Now, the reason the difference between Catholic and Protestant right here, as you'll see shortly, is that the Catholic position on evolution is supportive of, of its teaching, whereas the opposition to teaching evolution is from Protestant denominations. So, okay, now we as educators, you know, need to know this and need to figure out what to do. Now, the problem is complicated, I think, by the legal precedents that, and by the way in which the discussion in the U.S. has unfolded, because it might be nice in principle for us to, to all get around uh, a table or in a salon or a forum and talk about it. What, what do you think about evolution? And what do you think about the Bible? But, but instead we have an atmosphere of litigation that uh, marks the discussion of evolution in, in our country. And here's some of the precedents. The Tennessee Butler Act is a big deal. In 1925, the law, the Tennessee passed the law, quote, it shall be unlawful for any teacher supported in whole or in part by the public school funds of the state to teach any theory that denies the story of the divine creation of man as taught in the Bible. And then in 1925, the Scopes monkey trial was brought by the ACLU on behalf of John Scopes, who was found guilty and fined $100. So this is the famous Scopes monkey trial. In 1927, the Tennessee Supreme Court found the law to be constitutional under the Tennessee state constitution. And then in 1967, it wasn't until 1967 that it gets turned around in Tennessee. A teacher, Gary Scott, filed a class action lawsuit against his dismissal. He was fired because of this act. But he filed the suit in the U.S. District Court, not in the Tennessee court. And then within three days of this, the legislature went and repealed the, uh, uh, the law. So it was never, the law was never overturned in the courts in Tennessee. But a similar law was overturned uh, in uh, Al Alabama, I believe. So then another key preference, uh, a precedent, 
was in 1987 with the Edwards versus Aguilar case. The Supreme Court ruled that a Louisiana law, this is Supreme Court, U.S. Supreme Court, ruled that teaching, quote, creation science along with evolution was unconstitutional because the law was specifically intended to advance a particular religion. Now that, this is interesting because it, it means, of course, that in the school, you can't teach creation science because it's advancing a particular religion, namely Christianity. And then more recently, and I, some of you, I'm sure, are very familiar with this case from the pretending to the Dover, Pennsylvania School District. In 2005, the Dover District changed its biology curriculum to require that something called intelligent design, we'll talk about a couple more slides, be presented as an alternative to evolution. The U.S. District Court concluded that intelligent design is not science, and it barred the board from requiring teachers to denigrate the scientific theory of evolution. And then, however, in the subsequent election, all the members of the school board who had passed this were defeated for re-election, so the school board then didn't appeal the decision, and it never went and as it stands, the district court decision is the binding precedent on the matter because the school board, as newly constituted, didn't bother to appeal. Now, think about this. If uh, a couple slides ago I showed you that 40 to 60% of the population wants creationism taught in some version, some form, but you can't teach it in the schools, where does the discussion take place? So that's where there's a particularly important role for groups like this, I think, because it's only in the context of the hospitality pro provided by places of faith and places of worship that both sides can be taught and discussed and debated. Because now, uh, because of these laws, it seems to me that there's an unsatisfied appetite for the, the debate, which can't be easily met in any of the public schools. So what then would the two sides look like? So these seem to be some of the major players in the contemporary evolution debates. And I've divided them into three categories here, well, and then a couple of subcategories. There are the theistic evolutionists. And these are the folks who basically take the position that God created the universe and the living things in it and is working through science to manufacture the critters in the, that we've got. That God works through the natural processes that scientists study, through natural processes that scientists study to generate uh, the life according to his plan. And we'll see that there are uh, a number of Christian groups that are theistic evolutionists. Then there are the creationists, and these sort into two subcategories, the young earth creationists and the old earth creationists. And the young earth creationists argue that the earth is about 10,000 years old, and the old earth creationists acknowledge or that the Earth is uh, billions of years old. Now, and then the third group, which is very uh, prominent in the news these days, are the atheists, or sometimes called the new atheists. And so I'll mention a little bit about each's position on this so that you can see how you want to sort out. Now, one of the groups taking a theistic evolution position early on is the Roman Catholic Church, and in particular, an encyclical, a full-fledged encyclical from the Pope in 1950 called the uh, Humani Generis. And this is, quote, the teaching authority of the church does not forbid that research and discussions take place with regard to the doctrine of evolution insofar as it inquires into the origin of 
the human body as coming from pre-existing and living matter. For the Catholic faith obliges us to hold that souls are immediately created by God. However, this teaching must be done in such a way that the reasons for both opinions, that is, those favorable and those unfavorable to evolution, be weighed and judged with the necessary seriousness, moderation, and measure. And this was reaffirmed by Pope John Paul II in 1996 in a letter on evolution, which actually strengthened it, not just reaffirmed it, but somewhat strengthened it. So the Catholic position draws a big distinction between the body and the soul. And they, um, the Catholic position views the study of evolution as basically uncovering the history of the body, of the human body. And the soul that each of us has is created and given uniquely to each of us, directly by God. Um, and in the Catholic position, it would be at the moment of conception. Though other denominations might argue that the timing, so to speak, of the arrival of the soul uh, would be, could be different. Now, that has, this is an interesting, very interesting, very clear statement. Because among other things, what it does is it means all those country, all the countries which are primarily Roman Catholic have not had any problem with teaching of evolution. So throughout South America, there's no evolution problem going on. It's in the U.S., which is founded by Protestants, and in the Protestant tradition of the U.S., which is what really um, underlies the debates that we, that we have here. Now, at the other extreme... This is sort of in terms of age, of age roughly going time-wise here. We have um, the new atheists. And these is personified, especially by Richard Dawkins, whose book in 1976 was called The Selfish Gene. And, these are, and he has a series of books, um, very prolific writer, and a very energetic speaker. And... Let me give you some quotes. Our genes made us. We animals exist for their preservation and are nothing more than throwaway survival machines. The world of the selfish gene is one of savage competition, ruthless exploitation, and deceit. Then the universe we observe has precisely the properties we expect if there is at bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, Nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. And then, blindness to suffering is an inherent consequence of natural selection. Nature is neither kind nor cruel, but indifferent. Now, Richard Dawkins is an evolutionary biologist, and a pretty well-known one. Many people regard him as the best living evolutionary biologist. A point that could be disputed. <laughs> but you see, in here, he's bringing the weight of evolutionary biology on behalf of this claim of nature. And that's what I find so troublesome, is that does this, is he entitled to bring the subject that I'm a member of to, as a, as the authority behind this claim. Because the question is, from a scientist's point of view, is it really true that there is nothing but blind, pitiless indifference? Because there are a fair amount of data now that animals do have emotions. And I'm speaking especially of primates and, and of uh, vertebrates, which I think about, and of empathy in animals, and uh, an increasing number of experiments in this regard. So claims like this aren't factually accurate and thus misrepresent my discipline. And that's, that's a real problem if you're actually a member of this discipline, to have Richard Dawkins assuming the mantle of being the spokesman for the discipline. Now, uh, and he's a professor at Oxford. So then we get what I interpret at least in part as a reaction to Richard Dawkins by the intelligent design folks. Now these start out in, in you know, the different ways to, to trace the history here, but 
least in my thinking on it, uh, it began begins in a big way in 1991 with Philip Johnson with his book Darwin on Trial. Now, Johnson is a lawyer at uh, the, the law school at Berkeley. So he's not a scientist, he's a lawyer. And here's where you see the litigation history coming up. Because he writes this book, almost fantasizing it, if you will, that he was a lawyer during the Scopes trial. And he wouldn't have lost. You know, you, you, you just can tell that he wishes he were fighting it. And so throughout the, argue, the book, we have uh, a legalistic framing of the matter rather than a scientific matter. Like, I'd have gotten them on this point, and I'd have gotten them on that point, and I'd have, much as though a lawyer were cross-examining a witness, and Darwin would fail on the witness stand under uh, Johnson's cross-examination. But as you well know, of course, lawyers can destroy truthful witnesses on a witness stand if they're a good lawyer. I mean, that's a different skill than science. So this is what he writes. But given all that, that's actually, by the way, the issue we have to deal with is what is intelligent design? You know, regardless of what you think of Johnson and so on, what's going on here? Well... <laughs> Look at this. <clears throat> Make no mistake about it, in the Darwinist view, which is the official view of mainstream science, God has nothing to do with evolution. Now, in 1991, I, I think he's entitled to say that, given the prominence that, that Dawkins' writings have. Because Dawkins is writing from Oxford, and, you know, and the, after all, evolution is... Darwin was British, evolution comes from Britain, you know, this is, this is the word. And, and so, if I conjecture that if Dawkins hadn't written so provocatively, that might have been able to forestall Johnson's uh, writing and the intelligent design movement uh, would have gotten off to a much slower start. But as they say, let's see what's in it. He says, I assume that the creation scientists are biased by their pre-commitment to biblical fundamentalism. I am not interested in any claims that are based on a literal reading of the Bible. Now that doesn't sound much like creationism, does it? I mean, if you're, a heavy, if you're heavy into Genesis, that would not be a comforting statement. And then, there is no reason to doubt that particular Peculiar circumstances can favor, sometimes favor, dark-colored moths as opposed to light-colored moths, because everyone agrees that microevolution occurs. Now, that's quite a concession. That's conceding the very theory I gave you a little sketch of, where there's mutation followed by selection. He says, okay, yeah, that happens. Oh, all right. <laughs> that, that's a big deal. <laughs> and then... Many organs require an intricate combination of complex parts to perform their function. How can such things be built up by infinitesimally small inherited variations, each profitable? Now this is interesting, because the focus of intelligent design is not on the creation, the special creation of species, it's on the origin of organs, like the eye or the ear, or the lung. Now, the more recent writings from intelligent design are by Michael Behe. Now, Michael Behe is a biochemist at Lehigh University, and he's writing on behalf of intelligent design. The department at Lehigh actually voted, uh, in a sense, a motion of no confidence, but he's still a tenured faculty member there. But they're kind of mad that he's taking these positions. But but they're not foolish. And uh, I've had to review this book for uh, Christian Century, and, and I've read the whole thing. And, and here we continue to get this issue of how hard it is to make organs. Complexes of three or more different proteins are beyond the edge of evolution. The edge of evolution is jargon for can't be done by natural selection and mutation. 
So he's saying that three or more, if structure involves three or more proteins, then that's too hard to make uh, through mutation followed by natural selection. Now, actually, uh, Jerry, um, um, people have criticized this, and I, I think accurately, because he's assuming when, when he does his calculation that three, three prote tro proteins are too many to get, he's required that all three of them uh, form as a mutation at once. So he requires a triple mutation at the same time, which is, which is three times as improbable as having just one mutation. But if the mutations can come consecutively, so one of them is good, and then, then another one is good, and then it's followed by a third one. Then, then it, the time it takes to get three of them is, not, it is only three times as much as it is to get one mutation as opposed to uh, the mutation rate cubed. So there's a miscalculation here. But he says that programs to build organs, such as eyes, lids, and body segments, seem to occur in discrete modules, which is true. Elegant, coherent, functional systems upon which life depends are the result of deliberate intelligent design. It's just an assertion. We can take the purposeful designer in a very broad sense to refer to any being, principle, or mechanism external to our universe responsible for making it probable, for making it probable that our universe be fine-tuned for intelligent life. And then intelligent design is quite comparable with the view compatible with the view that the universe operates by unbroken natural law without active continuing intervention in nature. So this is, this is a complicated position. It's not about the special creation of species. It's about the creation of organs. And, and so it's not creationism in the sense that we usually think of it as a being God created a whole species or created the dog or the cat or the created humans. And, uh, and it doesn't sound all that religious. Where's, there's no God here. There's a clear disavowal of biblical literalism and of what's in the Bible. There's a rejection of... Uh, people who are creationists as biased. And so this is not actually a very comforting position to someone who is a creationist, even though it's lumped with the creationists. And the irony in it is that what happened in the Dover trial uh, is that the school board did want to um, teach creationism. And they didn't know that intelligent design wasn't, wasn't young earth creationism, wasn't their kind of creationism. They didn't bother to read it. And so they took sentences in which creationism was present and actually, like with a global search and replace command with a word processor, replaced creationism with intelligent design throughout the manuscript of the textbook they had. And then, the, the, of course, the judge found out about this. This was presented in court. And it made it look as though intelligent design was just creationism by another name, which is apparently what the school board thought. But it wasn't. And, and therefore, this creationism wound up being, def uh, intelligent design wound up being defeated. Um, and... So now the, the, they're faced, the intelligent design proponents are faced with the question of how to go forward, given that they've been rejected in court, but rejected for reasons that are somewhat irrelevant to their actual premises. But as creationists start to realize, and fundamentalists start to realize intelligent design is not very uh, friendly to their position, they're kind of losing interest in it. And as, as I say, if you were a biblical literalist, you wouldn't find any comfort whatsoever in the intelligent design position. So that's where this is at. Uh, and the question arises of, is it science? And I differ from most of my colleagues in that I, I think it is science. It's just very bad science. But it's, it is making claims. It's just making claims that you can show are false. 
And so could it be taught in a science course? Well, maybe as an example of bad science. I mean, it's hard to know. Um, I mean, if we only te teach good science, <laughs> they, people, kids won't know bad science when they see it. And so I think it's an educational issue is to decide whether or not it's strategically a good idea to go ahead and pick it apart in a science curriculum. Maybe we should, maybe we shouldn't. It, time is limited, as all of you know who are professors, you only have so much time in your course. So if you try to slide in a uh, piece of bad science in there, you're gonna have to jettison a piece of good science. And so you would wanna ask whether or not your educational mission is furthered by going over some bad science uh, at the cost of not do doing some good science. But that's the dilemma. Okay, so since this stuff, we get, um, other, even more recent folks. Now, the young earth creationists seem to be represented today mostly by this outfit called Answers in Genesis. They have a website, Answers in Genesis, and they have, they're the people who run the Creation Museum in uh, um, right about a taxi cab ride from the Cincinnati airport. And so these folks are really out there. Here's their statement. The account of the origins presented in Genesis is a simple but factual presentation of actual events and thereby provides, therefore provides a reliable framework for scientific research into the question of the origin and history of life. A reliable framework for the scientific research into the origin and history of life, mankind, the earth, and the universe. The various original forms or kinds, including mankind, were made by direct creative acts of God. So nothing about organs, it's you know, the whole shooting match, the whole person, you know, people as they exist were made directly by God. The living descendants, now here's the, here's the only qualification they have. The living descendants of any of the original kinds apart from man, may represent more than one species today, reflecting the genetic potential within the original kind. So they're willing to allow that there's some evolutionary change that's taken place from the original kinds. Now, if that were true, we would not see one big family tree. We would see a bunch of family trees, like a dozen of them, which would represent the original kind. And those family trees would root at these separate roots. So, if, if the original kind, if they could say the original living descendants of the original kind, they, they would be okay. But their, sec, their idea is that there are lots of kinds. And then we have this, the, actual, the great flood of Genesis was the actual, actual historic event worldwide, global in its extent and effect. And so they develop complicated scenarios to explain things like the Grand Canyon and the layers that you see exposed in the Grand Canyon in terms of the flood. So you get an attempt to develop a uh, kind of counter theory to geology as well as to evolution, biological evolution, uh, based on a, a kind of uh, on a genesis flavor. And in the Creation Museum, because they're young earth creationists, you know, you get displays like this diorama here. This is taken from their website. Where you have Eve, this is Adam and Eve, this is Eve, uh, and uh, dinosaurs, which are Tyrannosaurus rex. Here. Tyrannosaurus rex, however, is a vegetarian here. <laughs> And the person is walking along with a dinosaur. And uh, so they're coexisting. But my take on it is that, that you don't get uh, pain and suffering until the fall of Adam. We haven't had the fall of Adam yet, so this dinosaur has to be a vegetarian, I think. <laughs> so they're the folks you go to if you want you know, real hardcore creationism. In the meantime, counter to, to the uh, young earth creationists, we have other schools, if you will, of theistic evolution, 
which are uh, very active. Now, one of them is called the Clergy Letter Project that was started by Michael Zimmerman. And this is for clergy, and they have about 14,000 14, clergy members have signed a petition over the years, start, starting here in 2006 and running up now to 2012, signed a petition, which I'll, a passage I'll read to you in a minute, arguing to the, to the compatibility of uh, Christian thought and evolution. So we, the undersigned, Christian clergy from many different traditions, believe, believe the ultimate timeless truths of the Bible and the discoveries of modern science can comfortably coexist. We believe that among God's good gifts are human minds capable of critical thought and the failure to employ this gift is a rejection of the will of our Creator. One of the great activities that they uh, host or foster is every February, there's a weekend called Evolution Weekend, which is when um, the churches for these 14,000 clergy uh, have a little uh, talk uh, about evolution, uh, oftentimes on Sunday between services or sometimes on Sunday evening or the preceding Friday evening. And there's a Christian clergy letter, rabbi clergy letter, and other denominations. So they've adapted this so that it's uh, not necessarily Christian. And I actually spoke, spoke several times on Evolution Weekend and one time to a synagogue as the, um, the rabbi letter in particular gets more and more press. And then uh, very recently, there's, a, I, I think, a very interesting development which you might call evolutionary evangelism. And Michael Dowd is the person who's uh, responsible for this. And he's a, a minister, originally a uh, Roman Catholic. Um, and his wife is a Connie, is a science writer. And I must say, he, he would be a wonderful pastor. He, he's, he's really great to talk to. Uh, and he's interested in the emotional dimension of evolution rather than all this heady stuff. And he talks about how invigorating it is uh, to understand evolution, to, to internalize evolution, and to internalize not only your oneness with the rest of nature, but to internalize the idea that, that through evidence, you're learning about God. Uh, in fact, to, to put the matter in somewhat different terms, I remember when, when I was living in San Francisco, the, uh, the cover to, to the book, Evolution and Christian Faith, has an a, a icon there drawn by Betsy Porter, who's an artist. And... Um, I asked her, uh, uh, and we were talking at one time about you know, the spirituality of art, and she was saying, well, drawing an icon for me is a form of prayer. And I said, well, I mean, similarly, if the earth is God's creation and organisms in, God's cre in the earth are God's creation, then why isn't studying evolution, or in fact, studying evolution or studying nature? is also a form of prayer, the kind for which scientists are, are better positioned and better uh, talented at than, than artists. My art is dreadful. <laughs> but, um, and that's the kind of thing you get from Michael Dow. And here are his quotes. Religious faith and practice can be positively strengthened by what God is revealing through science. Studying evolution is like following cosmic breadcrumbs home to God. Only by looking through evolutionary eyes can we see our way out of the current global integrity crisis that is destroying economies and the ecosystems of the world. And then he, uh, just last year, had a project, which he talks about here, joined 38 of today's most inspiring Christian leaders 
and esteemed scientists for a groundbreaking dialogue on how an evolutionary worldview can enrich your life, deepen your faith, and bless our world. And he's referring, at his website, you can buy or download, listen to 38 taped interviews with different clergy people and scientists. Uh, and uh, I, I, I was one of the people interviewed. I don't know if I qualify as an inspired Christian leader, but I was honored to be included among those who do. So the, the message you get from, from Michael Dowd is that is a spiritual message. It, I mean, he's a preacher, and he's preaching evolution. And scientists were the scientists I know originally quite uneasy with this because he has an evangelical idiom to the way he puts things. And uh, but a number of us, as we've gotten to know him, realize that that he's very genuine. Even if to our way of thinking, I think in science, he's sometimes a little too bullish about science. We don't think it's quite as good as he does. It's, it's, uh, it does make its mistakes. And, uh, but, but his approach is really invigorating and it's novel. It's, it's a welcome addition to the scene. So that, I think, is the, uh, a good account, at least the best I can offer, of the spectrum of views that's available out there. And so let me conclude by mentioning some readings, three categories here. Jerry Coyne's book in 2009, Why Evolution's True, is um, a good account of exactly that, why evolution is true. Uh, the only uh, misleading part about uh, Jerry's book is that uh, he's, he's very reluctant to indicate any areas where, biology, where evolutionary biology could be improved. So it makes it look a little bit too much like a set piece. And Sean Carroll over here is a developmental biologist, and he's very interested in the formation of phenotypic complexity, that is the formation of how you get a complex body and complex behavior. So he's the guy involved with how do you translate from genes, which are boring, to interesting things, which is what the animal or plant looks like and what it does. How do you go from the gene to the, to the body? And then for evolutionary spirituality, there's Michael Dowd, whom I just mentioned. Francis Collins is uh, head of the NIH at the moment. He's a, an evangelical Christian. And his book will talk about how he discovered God through his encounters with the natural world. And, um, and then I'm shameless enough to tell you what my two latest books are. There's Evolution of Christian Faith in 2006 and The Genial Gene in 2009. So I hope that's helpful. And thank you very much. You uh, mentioned you were talking about uh, specifically organs relative to intelligent design. So my question is, um, is are there any animal and or human studies uh, that suggest that following organ transplants that uh, that individual ultimately begins to recognize or takes on the DNA of that organ and then ultimately um, transfer, transfers that into offspring? I don't think so. Um... That's not to say that that would be impossible, but uh, did, did you all hear the question? Yeah. Um, <coughs> so, you see, something like a kidney wouldn't, wouldn't really be a good candidate organ. Like if you transplant a kidney, you expect, to expect that DNA to turn up in the next generation. Because it's too late in the organism's life, the uh, the germ line, the, the genes that go into the eggs and the sperm are sequestered from the rest of the body very early in development. Um, so that's, that's why you can't have the inheritance of acquired traits. Uh, so you could inject genes all over your body, but, but meanwhile the genes that are going into your eggs and sperm are coming from a different source. 
So in order to, to get genes um, passed on to the next generation that were injected into it, you'd have to inject the genes when very early in development, when it was, uh, I forget how many cell divisions, but before the sequestration occurs, and it's about two or three cell divisions uh, early on. But you could do that, and I think that's the way you could produce uh, designer babies, um, which there's been some discussion on this, you probably know. And if you wanted to endow your children with certain genes, if you had them uh, fertilized, if you had the egg and the sperm fertilized in a petri dish, and injected a gene before the, say, second cell division or third cell division, you could get it in early enough before this, the division of the germ line from the somatic line had taken place. And if you did that, you could definitely get it transferred up, uh, into future generations. So it's a very scary prospect, and uh, I think a very feasible prospect. And um, I do hope we think about it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I guess it's a little bit of a long comment. I was fortunate to hear Eo listen to me a few years ago, and he spent some time chatting about um, a reconciliation of science and faith from a different perspective, not so much fighting with you know evolution versus creationism, but joining up with um, people of faith, even particularly creationists, as a way to I know that's Ed Wilson's position, that um, we could strengthen the conservation movement by um, shacking up with fundamentalists. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and that we would play to uh, the care of creation as being uh, a, a biblical mandate, if you will, and that both creationists and, and uh, theistic evolutionists, and, and everybody should sign on to that. I, I'm not sure uh, how successful that is for, for two reasons. Um, uh, I'm not sure about the purity of the sentiment. It does strike me as uh, man manipulative, and um, uh, it seems to me that a, a genuine, uh, as opposed to a political, but a, but actual spiritual union uh, is something to be strived for rather than a, a political alliance of this sort. Um, secondly, so far as I can tell, the creationists, or the fundamentalists, uh, whether or not they're, I don't know for sure if they're necessarily young earth creationists, but the, the fundamentalists would feel used in such a project uh, and they're sensitive, and, uh, reasonably enough, to being used uh, by a position that that they take as as uh, antithetical in in many other in many other political dimensions. So uh, I I don't favor making a political uh, overture to the fundamentalists. Uh, I prefer actually taking taking the matter to the scripture, you know, actually looking at the scripture and asking fundamentalists um, whether they could find any justification for rejecting evolution from the scripture. And uh, and as you can see, I think to the contrary that the antecedents of evolution are in the scripture. So I would rather see the debate on on religious terms rather than on political terms. I've had people ask me whether evolutionary biology, evolutionary theory and facts, 
is hostile to um, to spirituality because yeah. it's a necessary outcome that um, sort of Dawkins interpretation that there is no God. Or does evolution actually, the facts of evolution promote or somehow logically imply the existence of God? And I always play very neutral personally. With that. Yeah. Um, and I'm just wondering about your feelings. What, like, what well, do you say to people as you go with that question? Yeah, I would sort of agree with you. And, and I, I'm a little, di I differ a bit from Francis Collins in this result, in that, in this regard, is that I don't uh, deduce or uh, arrive at uh, a belief in God f from studying nature. It's the other way around. It's by studying nature that I would learn about God. And, uh, it to, and also, I guess I differ a bit from theologians who would try to to have more of an intellectual approach to God. Uh, I I value the, the, our emotional selves as much as our intellectual selves. Um, and to me, the uh, a belief in God is a, is an emotional uh, feel is a feeling. Uh, and I, I'm even hesitant to use the word belief. It's, it's a knowledge in the sense that you, f you feel for sure, you feel a definite certainty, uh, much the way you, one would with love. You don't deduce that there is love, you feel love. If there's love, it's, it's a feeling. And uh, of course, a lot of theologians get really upset with that, especially going back to Aquinas and so on, where we have these highly structured, uh, 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 intellectual debates about the nature of God, and, and I um, take a very emotional position. And that way, I, I'm sort of with uh, Michael Dowd in, in this regard. Uh, so it it uh, and, and I sort of feel in God's presence when I'm in community. I, I think God speaks to us through human community of, as much or more than through scientific evidence. But, um, so, so I, I'm not into the project of looking at nature to discover the existence of God. It's more given the existence of God, what this, the way nature is put together and what are the processes tell us about God and, and what's in the earth, what's in the world. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I, I'm not asked that terribly often. <laughs> and, uh, you know, obviously even in church, one doesn't get that deep <laughs> very often. <laughs> um, I don't know whether you've got a chance to read E.O. Wilson's new book. And if you have, how does, Just the videos, yeah. Yeah. How does that connect in. Do you see it fitting into to this particular discussion? I mean, the, um, on the group selection yeah. stuff? <laughs> yeah. Um, now, just to um, <laughs> fill you all in here, uh, w one of the areas of evolutionary biology which is not clear is uh, how we get the evolution of uh, empathy and of uh, of, of empathy and of um, emotions like love or attachment. And as an, as an evolutionary biologist, you would have to construct an argument somehow to the effect that, that, that if you're capable of loving, if you're capable of having empathy, somehow that, that will result in leaving more genes in the next generation. After all, we're talking about evolutionary biology. It is going to come down at some point <laughs> to uh, the propagation of genes. So how does that happen? How do you wind up propagating more genes by virtue of having empathy? And Wilson thinks that groups in which the members are empathetic or cooperative will, as a group, consist of individuals that collectively leave more offspring than uh, groups that are marred by a lot of internal conflict and uh, the lack of empathy. 
So the idea is that empathy helps groups prosper. And it's through the differential prosper of groups rather than single individuals that you get the evolution of uh, cooperation and empathy. Now that's an idea. Uh, this is the idea of group selection and it's been talked about for the last 30 years, uh, at least. And so the question is whether it's true. <laughs> it's an idea. Right? Could be. I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> and I think there are other ways to figure out how the genes for empathy and other human emotions wind up spreading in the gene pool and evolving. And I don't think it involves group selection. Now, you know, I give Wilson his due on this. He works on ants. And ants are uh, in nests, some species have very clear nests. And termites, for example, have very clear nests. And you can be in Australia and see a termite nest, a mound. And I remember, since I was a grad student, he, he was on the faculty there. And I remember him saying one time that all that has to happen is an anteater gets into a nest, grabs the queen in an ant nest, and it's all over. And so therefore, everyone has to fight the anteater. And uh, so he has, a very, he has a case where he's got himself a group, you know, the ant nest. And it has to work as a group against a predator. So, okay. But what about... Um, empathy in primates or empathy in vertebrates where we don't have discrete groups <coughs> and, and Wilson wants to generalize from the ant case and I don't know if it works it, I don't think it does in, in my uh, intuition on it and of course he might say I'm trying to generalize from vertebrates which I tend to focus on uh, and that that doesn't work for ants fair enough um, so uh, I've, and I don't want to digress too much here, I've been arguing for what it amounts to a third way in which uh, cooperation uh, evolves or forms. And I've been focusing on social development because the typical polarity is in this di discussion is to look at individuals versus groups. And the, the associated with the gene is a certain phenotype so the, uh, that the individual has. Now, it seems to me that, in fact, the phenotypes form, that, that animals have, form in a social context. That, that uh, and as we know from, in, in the, 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 there's a birth effect in the, in the human uterus, so that if, if uh, one, uh, in, in mammals generally, if the first, uh, if there are two, two embryos in the uterus, then the uh, hormones secreted by one affect the development of the other and vice versa. And so you wind up getting the children that are born being influenced, their phenotype is actually influenced by the developmental con context, and by, in that case, the social developmental context mediated chemically. Well, I think the same idea is true in a social environment where if you grow up in a certain way, in, in a certain context, you'll learn certain things, you'll have certain abilities. And, and if you grow up in a community uh, where there's empathy and love and can, that can be modeled and taught, then that becomes your phenotype. You assimilate that phenotype as part of your growing up in that environment. Now, the cash value of uh, having that is not the survival of the group, it's that you as an individual leave more offspring because of having acquired that phenotype. So social development can lead to individuals who are individually more successful than social development, which occurs in the absence of these traits. So I regard individual selection as being the evolutionary mechanism for the generation of um, just regular old individual selection as causing an evolution of cooperation, but I build the, uh, the formation of the cooperation as I look at it as part of the development, the organismal development. And therefore, it's, uh, 
really a different different take on it altogether. You don't need to still be locked into what's now multi-decades old polarity of individual selection versus group selection because you can still get individual selection but group development. And if you get group development, you can still benefit from individual selection, which is theoretically quite clear and easy to get. But if you have group development, then you wind up with the phenotype, which you otherwise would have thought you needed group selection to, to grasp. 